Today, I want to tell you about the central limit theorem, which is one of the most important theorems in probability. Roughly speaking, the central limit theorem says that if you add together a bunch of independent, identically distributed random variables, they will approximately be normally distributed. What is this normal distribution and where does it come from? To answer that, we'll look at the moment generating function of random variables. But first, let's start with a story. Taxes for the year came from five different regions of the kingdom. If the taxes from each region are independent and modeled as uniform on the interval from zero to 4,000, is it possible to estimate the chances that the taxes collected are at least 14,000? The generating function allows us to prove things about the sum of random variables much more quickly than the convolution method. By modifying this function slightly, there is another unexpected benefit. The moment generating function of a random variable x is defined to be the expected value of the exponential function applied to t times x. The moment generating function has the same information as the generating function for s greater than zero. This is because the generating function of the random variable x evaluated at s is the same as the moment generating function of x evaluated at the natural log of s. By definition, the moment generating function of x at zero equals one, but for t not equal to zero, there is no guarantee that this expected value is finite. Why do this? One reason is that another word for the expected value of a random variable is the first moment. For an integrable random variable x, the first moment, or often just moment of x, is the mean of x. Similarly, if x to the i is integrable, then the ith moment of x is just the mean of x raised to the ith power. Now consider again the moment generating function of x at t, which is the mean of e to the tx. Suppose that the derivative of the moment generating function with respect to t exists. If the derivative could be swapped with the expectation operator, that would give that the derivative of the moment generating function is the mean of the derivative of the exponential function at tx with respect to t. Differentiating brings down a factor of x, and we have the mean of x times e to the tx. Now swapping derivatives and means is not always valid, but it turns out to be valid for a moment generating function that is finite for a positive length interval that contains t equals zero. Now plug in zero for t in the mean of x times e to the tx. That just leaves us with the mean of x. In other words, the first moment of x is the first derivative of the moment generating function evaluated at t equals zero. By taking more derivatives of t, it is possible to obtain higher moments of x. In general, suppose that the moment generating function of x at t exists for a positive length interval. Then for a positive integer i, the ith derivative of the moment generating function with respect to t evaluated at t equals zero is the mean of x raised to the ith power. An analytic function is one for which the Taylor series expansion converges to the function. In particular, if the moment generating function is analytic around zero, then it is equal to one plus the first moment of x times t, plus the second moment times t squared over two factorial, and so on. This earns this function the moment generating function name. Now consider how shifting and scaling affects the moment generating function. If the random variable x has moment generating function mgf sub x at t, then for real values a and b, the moment generating function of a times x plus b at t will be the exponential function applied to tb times the moment generating function of x at at. 
The way this works is to just to find the mean of the exponential of ax plus b quantity times t. Distributing the t gives us our e to the bt term, and then we have the exponential function applied at atx, but that in expectation is just the moment generating function of x evaluated at a times t. Recall that standardizing random variables means shifting down by the expected value and dividing by the standard deviation. This changes the moment generating function as follows. If x has mean mu and standard deviation sigma, then for s equal to x minus mu all divided by sigma, the moment generating function of s is the exponential function applied to negative t mu over sigma times the moment generating function of x evaluated at t over sigma. Now suppose that s sub 1, s sub 2, etc. are random variables that have already been standardized so that they have mean 0 and standard deviation 1. So the mean of s sub i is 0, and the mean of s sub i squared is going to be the variance of s sub i, and that's just going to be 1 as well. Then if the moment generating function of the s sub i is analytic, then the first few terms are known to be 0 and 1. So this moment generating function will be 1 plus 0t plus t squared over 2, and then we get plus the third moment of s sub i times t cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. Now, the expected value of the sum of the s sub i from 1 up to n will just be the sum of the individual means, which are all 0, so they sum to 0. And the variance of the first n of the s sub i's is going to be the sum of the variances because they're independent and so uncorrelated. And so that's just going to add up to n. So if we take the random variable w, which is the sum of s1 and s2 all the way up to sn, and divide by square root of n, then the variance of w will be 1 over n times the variance of the sum. And so w is going to have mean 0 and standard deviation 1. The moment generating function of w, because w is the sum of n independent random variables, it's the product of the moment generating function of all those variables. The moment generating function of s sub i divided by square root of n is the moment generating function of an individual s sub n evaluated at t divided by the square root of n. And because we're adding together n of these random variables, we raise the moment generating function to the nth power. In infinite series form, this tells us that the moment generating function of w at t starts off 1 plus t squared over 2n plus the mean of s sub i cubed t cubed over 3 factorial n to the 3 halves power, and so on, all raised to the nth power. Now because I've got an n in the denominator here, and an n up here, when I take the limit as n goes to infinity, that's going to be the exponential function evaluated at the thing multiplying the 1 over n, which is t squared over 2. Is there a random variable whose moment generating function is the exponential function applied to t squared over 2? Yes. And this distribution is called the normal distribution. We're going to say that z has a standard normal distribution if it has density 1 over the square root of tau times the exponential function at minus x squared over 2. And we're going to write z is normally distributed, the n stands for normal, with parameters 0, that's the mean of the random variable, and 1, that's the variance of the random variable. Note that tau here is the full circle constant. It equals 2 times pi, where pi is the half circle constant. And then one can easily check from that density that if we have a standard normal random variable, 
then the moment generating function of that random variable is e to the t squared over 2. Now this leads us to the central limit theorem, which says that the standardized sum of random variables with finite variance approaches that of a normal random variable. To be precise, the central limit theorem says the following. Suppose that x sub 1, x sub 2, etc. is an IID sequence of random variables with finite mean mu and variance sigma squared. Then for all numbers a, the limit as n goes to infinity of the probability that the sum of the xi minus n times mu divided by sigma times square root of n is less than or equal to a, that limit as n goes to infinity will equal the probability that z is less than or equal to a, where z is a standard normal random variable. Now, most modern calculators can find the probability that z is less than a for any a. In R, you use the command p norm of a in order to find that value. Now, recall for a standard uniform, u is uniform from 0 to 1, and that has an expected value of 1 half and a variance of 1 12th. So if I multiply that by 4,000, that's going to give me a uniform over 0 to 4,000 with mean 1 half times 4,000 or 2,000. And the variance is going to be 4,000 squared divided by 12. Now let's take five random variables, w sub 1 through w sub 5, that are IID with the same distribution as w. Armed with this information, one can standardize the sum inside the probability function. So if I want the probability that w sub 1 plus w sub 2 and so on up to w sub 5 is at least 24,000, I can first subtract the mean of the sum, which is 5 times 2,000, from both sides of the inequality. Then I can divide both sides of the inequality by the standard deviation of s. The thing on the left, I can then approximate as a standard normal. The expression on the right of the inequality comes out to be about 1.549193. And using 1 minus the p norm at 1.549193 in R tells us the probability that a standard normal is at least this value and gives a probability p of about 0.06066. For discrete random variables, it turns out that the half integer correction can help the central limit theorem be more accurate. When a random variable s must be an integer for i any natural integer, the probability that s is less than or equal to i is the same as the probability that s is less than or equal to i plus 1 half. And the probability that s is greater than or equal to i is the probability that s is greater than or equal to i minus 1 half. This is called the half integer correction. For example, suppose that d1 up through d10 are iid d6s, that is that they're fair rolls of a six-sided die. Then we're going to estimate the probability that d1 plus d2 up through d sub 10 are at most 30 using the central limit theorem. Well, for a fair six-sided die roll, the average value of d is going to be the sum of the minimum and maximum values, 1 and 6, divided by 2. That gives 3.5. You can also work out the variance, and that's going to be 61.25. So using the half integer correction, we're going to say that the probability that d1 plus d2 up through d10 being at most 30 is actually equal to the probability that s, the sum, is at most 30.5. Now there's no approximation yet. At this point, we're still just doing things exactly. I can subtract 
10 times 3.5 from both sides of the inequality. I can divide by the standard deviation of s, which is the square root of 10, because I'm adding 10 things, times 61.25. The thing on the left, I can approximate by a standard normal, and the value on the right can be calculated as negative 0.1818. And this evaluates to about 0 0.4278. So that's the story of the central limit theorem. It allows us to approximate probabilities involving the sum of independent random variables using the normal distribution. See you next time.